All right, folks, so time for some literary terms uh, that you need to know to understand the Canterbury Tales. Uh, and I've written them all out here. I'm just going to go down the list and go over them. Uh, write them in your notes, please. Please write them in your notes uh, so that you have them. Let's start out with couplet. When we were reading um, Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, we noticed that there was a shift from alliterative verse writing to poetic writing. Uh, that shift is is complete in Chaucer. Uh, again, Chaucer was writing in the city. The Gawain poet was writing in the country. I, the shift had not really made it out there, but it definitely had hit um, the cities. Uh, the simplest form of poetry is the one that Chaucer most frequently uses. Uh, the things that we're going to read from the Canterbury Tales are all written in what's called couplets, uh, as opposed to, you know, quatrains. A couplet is simply a pair of of lines that share and rhyme, right? Rhyme. So if you're writing in couplets, the rhyme scheme is A, A, B, B, C, C, D, D, and so on and so forth. So if I were to look, for example, at the Canterbury Tales, you can see couplets in action. When in April the sweet showers fall and pierce the drought of March to the root, and all the veins are bathed in liquor of such power as brings about the engendering of the flower. Can you see it? Fall, all, power, flower. Uh, breathe, breath, heath. That's a slant rhyme. Don't worry about it. Sun, run. Um, engages, pilgrimages, strands, lands, and wend, quick, sick. You know, like, this is Dr. Seuss rhyming. It's the easiest kind of rhyming there is, and Chaucer makes use of it throughout the Canterbury Tales. Now, he has some sections that are written in quatrains and, and ballad stanza and stuff like that, but we're not going to read those. We're, we're focusing on the ones that are written in couplets, so you need to identify couplets. They're not going away, by the way. Lots of poetry is written in couplets moving forward, and so you need to know the difference between couplets and quatrains and, you know, all those sorts of things. So uh, we also talked about in the last lecture what a frame story is. It's um, a story within a story. So a story within a story. I'll put a, a parentheses and outer story sets and frames one or more inner stories. And we talked about some examples of this Forrest Gump with Forrest sitting on the bench. Um, Titanic, uh, where the old lady is on the boat um, thinking about what happens on the Titanic. And so theoretically, it starts and ends on the boat, you know, over the ocean. And then the actual story, the main story is within this frame. And there's lots of stories like this. Inception is sort of like a frame within a frame within a frame. Um, and there's there's a number of stories that are written this way. And this, this is not the only one we're gonna run into this year. Uh, but the frame is a trip to Canterbury with a storytelling contest um, that is theoretically going to be awarded. And the, meat of it is the individual stories. So the Canterbury Tales is like one of those family picture frames that you probably have on the wall somewhere in your house. It's a big frame, but inside there's a bunch of little frames and those are the stories. Uh, prologue. A prologue is um, the chapter that occurs before the main um, part of the story. It usually introduces the setting and the characters and does some of that uh, sort of uh, exposition, information dump kind of things. Uh, usually a prologue is set significantly before the story proper. Um, you know, for example, Harry Potter. Uh, you've got this scene with uh, the kid in the crib and Voldemort comes in and shazam, like it kills everybody with the curse and then he's taken to the Dursleys. Like that's all sort of prologue-y stuff as opposed to... Um, you know, the main story, which is going to start with Harry at, at the Dursley's house. Uh, but there's there's lots of examples of stories that have prologues that are set significantly in the past or involving characters that we haven't met yet. And it's going to be important later. Uh, the prologue in the Canterbury Tales serves to set up the frame narrative. So yeah, I'm going to call it the, I'm going to put it in quotation marks, chapter um, that comes before the first chapter uh, usually introduces important characters or events often uh, set earlier than the story itself. 
Uh, in this case, it's not really set earlier, it just introduces all of our narrators. It's going to give you all of the various voices that are going to tell the Canterbury Tales, and that's that's important. So it's the first thing we've run into that has a prologue. Uh, a morality play is one of the, the styles of medieval literature. We, we talked about how we're going to have a slice of various types of medieval literature. Um, we already know medieval romance, you know, it's a story that has a romantic hero who follows the code of chivalry and he has to undergo a test of love. Uh, medieval romance is set in, in some sort of setting with kings and queens and castles and quests and, you know, all that kind of stuff. A morality play is a very different type of literature and we're going to read one of these. It's called The Pardoner's Tale. Uh, so the morality play is a Christian religious allegory in which characters represent vices and virtues and um, which teaches an obvious Christian moral lesson. Right, so uh, there's gonna be a story a classic morality play, a story in which you've got like three characters and one of them is a woman named, I don't know, Chastity. Uh, and she's got uh, two guys who are interested in her. And one of them is named, I don't know, Devotion. And the other one is named Lust, right? And so the story is theoretically a story about these people with these weird names, but obviously the people represent the things they've been named for and the action of the story is teaching you a moral lesson about how to behave right and what you should do and what influences you should allow to influence you you know stuff like that um, these were put on as plays oftentimes in churches uh or these morality players would travel from town to town and put on the play in the church and everybody would go and watch and they would be like educated through acting um educated in sort of a religious way so morality plays were big in the Middle Ages, and actually they still have their influence today. One of the, the classic morality play tropes that was seen again and again is a scene where a character is trying to make a really tough decision, and shazam, an angel shows up on one side and a devil shows up on the other, and they both are whispering into the character's ear, uh, trying to influence that character's action. And we see this in cartoons. You know, Kronk in The Emperor's New Groove is a great example. Uh, but, you know, there, there's all kinds of moments where that happens, and we owe that to the medieval morality play. It's just one of the little bits of it that's hung on throughout the years. Uh, poetic justice. One of the elements of every morality play ever is what we call poetic justice, is when uh, characters get what they deserve, uh, good or bad. Right? We like, it's karma. Karma is essentially what poetic justice is. We call it poetic justice because in the real world, it so rarely happens, right? In the real world, the bad person often gets rewarded for their bad behavior. Uh, people who cheat on tests get away with it and, and get a good grade that they didn't deserve. Um, and, you know, people who studied hard still don't do as well as they should. And that's not just, it's just the way it is. But in our literature, in our stories, we love to see things turn out the right way. We love to see the bad guy get punished and the good guy get the girl and improve in social status and all of those sorts of tropes that are associated with literature. And morality plays always end this way. The bad people get punished or and, and the good people get rewarded. And sometimes your protagonist makes a bad choice and then of course they inevitably get punished with it. A morality play generally ends up with people dying and going to hell or going to heaven, uh, but it is what it is. Uh, so poetic justice is something we're gonna see uh, in, in the morality play, obviously, that we're gonna read in, in the Canterbury Tales. But there are other situations in the Canterbury Tales where people do or do not get poetic justice depending on what Chaucer's trying to do. Um, next, we've got satire. This is sort of a new genre that, that Chaucer is playing with. Um, it was not a really popular genre before this. As you can see how, how earnest and honest um, you know, Sir Gawain and, and Beowulf are about teaching you what's right um, by giving you positive examples um, and negative examples and letting you sort of see where you belong on that spectrum. Satire is actually a form of comedy 
that exposes something to ridicule to generate change. So generally we, we exaggerate things and show you the problems with things in a way that's funny. And at the end of it, you've had a good laugh, but you're like, huh, why don't we change that? And this is a, a genre that is alive and well today. I mean, think of all the all the news satire shows that are on TV, uh, the Colbert Report, the Daily Show, um, things that, you know, basically show you the problems in society in such a way that we laugh at it. John Oliver, uh, laugh at it and think it's funny. And then at the end, um, we scratch our heads and are like, yeah, why, why aren't we changing that? But there's also all kinds of uh, movies and shows that are satire. Uh, if you ever watch... Um, you know, South Park or Family Guy or The Simpsons or uh, Rick and Morty. It doesn't matter what you're watching. Like a lot of those shows are going to pick problems in society, uh, problems in human nature, and they're going to show them to us in such a way that they're funny, but disturbing. And so you'll walk out of the, out of the room afterwards, um, thinking about the things that they've showed you and um, why they need to change. It's a, it's a change generating situation. And so uh, Chaucer wants to change some things. Uh, he's noticed problems with literature, the problems with tropes and how, how things always happen the same way. And he's gonna expose those to ridicule. So, you know, at the end of it, you're like, huh, I wonder why in night stories it always goes this way. He'll, he'll change things around on you or he'll satirize the church, which is a really dangerous thing to do at the time, but uh, he'll find a problem with the Catholic church and he'll expose that problem by making it look ridiculous, putting a ridiculous character in his story and letting us judge them. And that's how satire works. So there's gonna be a lot of satire, it's gonna be funny. I think you'll enjoy some comedy for a change. Um, next thing we wanna talk about in the Canterbury Tales is narrator. Uh, like I said, Chaucer, uh, has a bunch of different stories told from different point of views. And so he's going to be shifting narrative perspective all the time. Now, when we talk about narrator, uh, you know, a narrator is essentially the voice telling the story. That's it. Uh, and, and there's lots of different ways teachers will talk to you about narrator. That I'm just going to say narrator. Uh, but some teachers will say, what's the narrative perspective? In other words, what perspective is the narrator using to, to look, up, look at and tell the story? Or they'll call it the point of view. These are all sort of synonyms. Don't worry about them. Just know that they all sort of mean the same thing. Uh, so the voice telling the story up until now, uh, everything we've read in class has had this sort of third person omniscient um, storyteller voice, the voice of the, the bard, the voice of the storyteller who is telling the story. Chaucer breaks that norm and shifts from perspective to perspective throughout the story. Uh, so your prologue is going to be told from the perspective of Chaucer, the overall narrator. But when we jump into the internal frames, uh, you'll have the Miller. Suddenly Chaucer is telling the Miller's story in the Miller's voice. And so we have these shifts and you need to pay attention to the shifts, who's talking, who's thinking, uh, what they're saying and why they're saying it. It adds a little level of complexity to the story that it might not otherwise have had. But in order to talk about narrative perspectives and point of view, you need to know some things about different types of narrators. And so I'll go over those really quickly. Uh, the first thing we have is the difference between first, second, and third person narration. Uh, first person, how do we know it's first? First person, well, it uses I and um, is looking out the eyes of a character, right? There's a character in the story. That character is talking about things like they're understanding them as they're happening. Um, that person is a first person narrator. The other common one is a third person. It uses he or she right uh, throughout, I guess I should put those each in individual quotation marks. Um, and the voice is sort of, uh, put a comma there, uh, sort of a disembodied overhead camera angle right? Uh, whoever's telling the story is not part of the story. They're looking down on the story and seeing it and narrating it to you, kind of uh, like announcers at a football game. 
as opposed to uh, being in the football player's head and seeing out of their out of their eyes. Uh, second person narration is very rare. You probably don't even need to know it, but if I'm going to say first and third, you're going to want to know what second is. Um, the second person narration is you see it in video games that have text that you read, especially RPGs, uh, and then choose your own adventure books and things like that. So it uses you and talks directly to the reader. You know, so the first person is I went here, I went there. Um, second person is you went here, you went there. And third person is he went here and she went there, right? And that's the distinction that you can make. Most of you probably already know that, but it's, it's worth knowing so you can think about how Chaucer is casting the various narrators and, and how they're being worked out. Uh, next, we have the distinction between a limited narrator and an omniscient narrator. A limited narrator only knows what the character or sometimes characters, depending on, on whether you're in one character's head or you're shifting, um, no. Whereas an omniscient narrator is sort of a voice of God that knows everything, right? So an omniscient narrator knows what, how the story's gonna end, knows what every character's thinking and what their plans are and what their subplots are and all of that kind of stuff, whereas a limited narrator does not. Uh, a good example of this would be like The Hunger Games. A lot of people have read that book. Um, the Hunger Games is told from the first person perspective of Katniss Everdeen. Um, she only knows what she knows, so she's a very limited narrator. She doesn't know what Snow is doing or what any of the other stuff that, that's happening. Um, the Lord of the Rings is an interesting example, too. It's a third-person narration, but it's a limited third-person narration. If you look at Tolkien, he's always giving you the perspective of the weakest person in the room, which is usually a hobbit. Uh, and so you're always getting this, this third-person perspective, very limited in understanding from um, the weakest or, or least knowledgeable character present. And I think that's interesting and worth worth noting as well. Uh, next we have tenses. Uh, narrators have tenses. Uh, you're going to see the Canterbury Tales written in the past tense. Uh, your verbs end with ed. Uh, everything has already happened. Right? Look at that. ed. Uh, so sometimes you have irregular verbs that don't do that like when. I went to the store and picked, there's an ED, out a apple and ate it. That's irregular. It's past tense um, while I was driving home, you know, like, but that's, that's sort of past tense narration. Whereas present tense, um, things are coming at you um, and verbs often end with S or ING. Um, so in this case, I go to the store and pick out an apple and eat it on the way home, right? Like it's, it's all happening. It's coming at us immediately. And that's, that's present tense. Uh, Chaucer, I don't think plays with present tense at all. I think everything that he does stays in the past tense, but it's, it's important that, you know, uh, back to our original example though, like um, the Hunger Games is written in the present tense. Katniss Everdeen is looking out of her eyes. We're, we got eye, we're hearing her thoughts. We're seeing her perspective. We only know what she knows and everything is happening like in the instant, in the now, and it's coming right at us. So um, next we have reliable versus unreliable narrators. A reliable narrator is a voice you can trust to tell the truth. And an unreliable narrator, as you might imagine, is a voice you cannot trust to tell the truth. Now there's various types of um, unreliable narrators. A great example of an unreliable narrator is uh, the voice in Edgar Allan Poe's The Telltale Heart. I don't know if you remember that. It's about the guy who murdered another old man who, who had a vulture eye, chopped him up and buried him under the floorboards. The guy is just crazy. And he tells you things that can't possibly be true, but he believes them. And so he's unreliable because he's crazy. But what about an unreliable narrator who is lying to you? because he wants you to see his side of the story. There's a great movie called The Usual Suspects. Um, you, I just, I just spoilered the whole thing for you. But, you know, you go through the entire story, and at the end you find out your, your narrator's unreliable, and you're like, what? You know, so 
you can do a lot of things with unreliable narrators, and Chaucer is going to give you a very clearly unreliable narrator in the partner, uh, and that's going to impact uh, the story as a whole. Last two terms, and then I'm gonna I'm gonna close this thing down uh, and call it over. Um, Chaucer is a big user of characterization. I haven't thrown this term out because we haven't really used it in a lot of meaningful ways. But whenever you have a character in a story and that character is being described and you're learning things about that character, we call that process characterization. And characterization falls into one of two categories, either direct characterization or indirect characterization. Direct characterization is when an author tells the reader about a character, characters, I don't know, personality or morality, right? So uh, if I were to say to you that so-and-so is bad, you don't have to think about that. You just know uh, it's been told to you. And that's what we call direct characterization. Uh, it's very common in older stories. Uh, we don't see it as much as in modern stories because we like to find out our characters for ourselves in, in more modern works. Uh, but it doesn't have to be the author, you know, the narrator telling you the character's bad. You could have another character who's like, oh yeah, that, that Curly's bad, right? Like he tells you something about this character and then you internalize it. And as a reader, you don't have to think about it. You're just told. Uh, whereas indirect characterization is what an author implies to the reader about a character's personality or morality. I just spelled character wrong. Good job, Howard. There we go. Let's fix that. Um, through that characters uh, description actions words etc so when the characters describe the clothes that they're wearing the way that they're holding themselves the way they look at people the way they talk to people this can tell you something about their personality uh, are they are they looking down on other characters? Are they angry? Are they drunk? You know, like what kinds of things can you deduce from their demeanor? Uh, that's indirect characterization. Then we can look at their actions. Remember, uh, in in direct characterization, I told you so and so is bad. Uh, that's direct characterization. But indirect characterization, if your if your character, I don't know, punts a puppy dog off a bridge, we didn't tell you that character's bad, but now you know. You've seen it and you can make a judgment about them based on their actions. That would be indirect characterization. Uh, and then their words. If, if a character says something that's uh, really mean-spirited or racist or evil, you make judgments about them based on the things they say. That's indirect characterization as well. And so Chaucer, the, the reason that I'm giving you these two um, definitions right now is as we read the prologue, we're going to see Chaucer do something really interesting. Um, that's almost unique to him. He's going to give you direct characterization about characters. He's going to tell you about characters. And, and the direct characterization always fits the social norms, always sounds nice. Um, and you can buy that and you can believe it. But then he's going to give you indirect characterization that conflicts with what he's told you directly. So he might say such and such a character is a, a great person. Uh, and a good monk or, you know, a, a whatever it happens to be. But as you're reading the rest of the description of the character, you'll find that what is implied about the character is actually sometimes the opposite of what was directly stated. So Chaucer gets away with this because he's like, look, I told you he's a great guy. Like, I'm not insulting him. Um, it's, it's only the description of him that implies negative things. And so the conflict in Chaucer between direct and indirect characterization uh, makes you more of a, I don't know, a detective in your reading, because you have to look at what he's saying, but then what's he really saying? And that adds a nuance and complexity to the story and sometimes a little bit of irony too. All right, if anybody has any questions on these, leave that questions down for me in the comments. I will be happy to answer them, uh, but hopefully this will help you as we read the prologue to Chaucer's Canterbury Tales. Thanks.